Well, it's time for another episode of the Emissary Podcast. I'm excited to be with you this week. Paul Edwards, along with my co-host and partner in crime, Jason Todd. Jason, welcome back to the show. Good to see you again. I am always excited to be here to talk with our guests. I'm not just saying that, uh, but today we've got a entrepreneur and a second life for him as a ghostwriter for people who want to tell their stories. And I think, I think that is so fascinating. Plus, I stole a little bit of information from his website about living with Vikings. Um, and you cannot just say you live with the Vikings without unpacking it. So welcome Rick to the Emissary Authors Podcast. It pops into be, and I love that you started with that, that, that totally threw me for a little bit of a loop. I was not expecting that in the intro. Uh, well, I always want to keep people on their toes. I, I figure, uh, tap dancing is a good skill. So take. Take it away. Tell us about this whole Vikings thing. And I think you said eating whale meat or something. I did. And that, that actually is on the website. You know, it's, it's, um, whenever you meet people, you like to learn some of the things that nobody else knows. And so I just, I put it out there on my website is that I did live with Vikings and it was during COVID. So, um, a few things that's to give us some context. So, um, yes, I was an entrepreneur and, and I, and I write ghostwrite full time. Uh, but my truest background is I'm a registered nurse. So I've been an RN for almost 30 years. And when COVID emerged, uh, there was a massive shortage of nurses everywhere. And because of my background working with the federal government department of defense, I got a call and they said, Hey, we need one nurse to go to Norway. I'm like, all right, for how long? And this was when the world shut down in March of 2020. And, um, I, my wife, uh, and I are sitting there, sitting there and she says, hold on a sec. She puts her hand over the phone. She goes, we need to talk. This. I'm like, it's Norway. I always want to go to Norway and that's where the Vikings live. And, and, and so anyway, long story short is they said it's 30 days. Uh, we can get you to Norway because the world was shut down and, um, to, I'm going to drop a little, uh, tap dance there. They flew me over a private jet. So but that's another, that's another story. Yeah. Uncle Sam, they, they flew me over in style, but I get to Norway and, uh, I, I thought I was going to go to Oslo, maybe work at a military installation, something. Oh, I, I, that's what I was thinking. And, um, we land in, a uh, uh, a remote air base and it's cold and it, everything you would expect of Norway, I see, and, and it's, it's just all that get on a bus and we keep driving. And when we stopped driving, we were on a tiny Island, um, in the Barrett sea and I lived in a hotel and I was the only American there and I lived with Vikings and they were legit Norwegians. They were proud of their Viking heritage and I called them Vikings and they loved it. And so I lived with Vikings for almost a year and a half. It turned the 30 day stretched into it's a year and a half, one of the best experiences of my life. And, uh, the thing, the thing about Norway, the whale meat is that, um, Norway is one of the few countries on the planet that actually has illegal whale hunting because they eat it. It's part mm -hmm. of what they eat. They use the whale, the way we eat steak and cows, um, whales is that to them. And so they hunt whales. And, um, at first I was like, oh, I, I don't know about this. Uh, and, the, and the chef put our hotel, um, said, you're going to like it. And, um, it wasn't that it was almost like a very rich irony kind of steak. And, um, we had whale tacos, we had whale tartare, we had whale steak, we had whale burgers. Uh, and it's the same way you think about going and picking up a uh, ribeye and hamburger meat and ribs is the same way they think about whale meat. And so I got to eat whale meat and reindeer too, by the way. Wow. Yeah. I sense yeah. in you a a love for new experiences and new stories to tell. Yeah. You know, isn't that the essence of everything? I, I mean, just the, the essence of connection and um, sharing and, um, you know, the funny thing is uh, by nature, I'm an introvert. Um, I, I think I'm a situ situational extrovert, but by nature, um, I wouldn't normally just be, the, be a storyteller in, in public. It's when, um, somebody asks. Like you introduced the whale meat. And of course that was almost like a cue, but, um, yeah, it is. It's, I think it's the essence from the way back when, you know, sitting around campfires and we had tablets and stones, you know, stories were what brought us and kept us together. So, um, great observation. I, I never really thought about that until you just mentioned. Well, I'm a situational extrovert as well, uh, which is probably why I can sense it, uh, within you because there is a moment where an individual starts talking about something that they experienced and they come alive. And it's a marked difference from 
the other times where they're just like pattering through life. And I, and I thought, well, if, if you're, if you are, uh, uh, assertive enough to put that on your website, um, there's a good story behind that. Something meaningful to you. You weren't just dropping it out there just to be cute and funny. Uh, and I think that that's probably what it takes to be a ghostwriter too. You got to find something that is meaningful and valuable and get to the heart of that, of what that person wants to communicate, which I think is a remarkable skill. Yeah. I, the whole, I looked out because I, I write a lot of notes and, um, just a lot of things here nailed it and get to the heart of it. Um, it's not just our own yeah, you, and you know, just to back up, you're exactly right. I didn't put it up there just to be cute. I thought somebody's going to see that and there's going to be some connection there, uh, whether it's Norwegian or the quirkiness of it or whatever. And that person may be the one who I get to work with. That person may be the one who says, you got to talk to that guy. Um, and so. There is, but getting to the heart of it is, I, I couldn't agree more to, and it's, it's part and parcel to getting to the, um, the telling somebody else's story is getting to the heart of their matter. Mm. I'm super curious. Do you find in your introvertedness, do you, is that a skill that, or a personality trait that enables you to see other people's stories more clearly, or how do you, exp how do you use that in your work? Those are great questions, Jason, I, because I've always, um, probably like you, uh, maybe Paul, I'm, I'm not I don't know, but, um, I was always super quiet, uh, quiet to the extent that, um, I have a loud family. I have younger brothers who are loud. They talk, they, they dominate conversations. My dad is the same way. My mom's the same way. And I was always the one with the book in the corner and I was fine with that. And for the longest time, um, not only did I think, but I think certain people thought maybe there's something wrong with him. You know, nowadays, nowadays there's all kinds of labels and, um, spectrums and whatnot. And, uh, whether that's true or not, that's just who I was. I was always fine by myself with the book, but one of the things I think you touched on is while my eyes and head were in a book, my ears were always were in tune to what was going on around me, mm -hmm. um, what was being said. And, uh, I, I picked up on all that and I picked up on the nuances of how people said it. And, um, so it's interesting you say that because for the longest time, I always thought int being introverted, um, introversion was something negative that I was, sub we were supposed to be out of our shells. And I realized that, uh, that later on, it was actually something that I could tap into. It's a strength. And I, I think you might agree. It's a strength because we, we hear between the lines. When, when people say things, we, because we're not trying to interject and respond, uh, at least that's my, my understanding of how I am as an introvert, I can hear between the lines, like, what are they really trying to say? And then when you yeah. see, when you see them say it, you pick up on, um, there's almost an empathic, uh, nuance to being introverted. There's, you get one is flooded, not only with what's being said, but how they say it and you, yeah. uh, you can. I, I truly believe that the truest introverts, not the ones who think it's, I'm, I'm an introvert, but the ones who truly are, they're also empathic. And, um, I found that it's a strength and, uh, rather than try and double down on what people said, I'm supposed to be more extroverted, more talkative, be out there, call the girl. Um, I thought, let me double down on what it means to be an introvert and an empath and see where that takes me. And I mean. I, I can't complain. You know, I, I won't complain about where I am today in my life. Yeah. The, the phrase that came to my mind, and I know Paul's got a question there burning you up. Um, the phrase that came to my mind as you were explaining this, this idea of being an introvert, what it means to you is my experience is that I can quiet my spirit. And I use that word on purpose. I can quiet my spirit so much that I can see and hear yours. Hmm. You know, truth, truth. I love it. I used to, uh, <clears throat> I used to tease, uh, actually, um, I've, I've grown surprisingly more in introverted and reserved over the years. And what I, so I was quite outgoing and talkative and constantly wanting to communicate with people for the longest time. And then I sort of used up all the energy that I had for that 
in my thirties, uh, you know, as an insurance sales guy, just networking all the time. But what I remember telling introverts at the time was, you know, people would ask me to give talks about networking and I'd say, you know, it, if you're introverted, you don't need to be afraid of this because you have, you have the ability to sit there and soak up so much valuable information that you can then turn around and leverage elsewhere, uh, in terms of connecting people and making introductions and all that kind of thing. And as I've moved into writing, it's been much, much the same sort of thing. Um, people will ask me, you're quiet and how come you're not talking? And I say, well, I talk a lot better with my ears than I do with my mouth. <laughs> Because, and, 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 and the proof is in the pudding, right? Because when the authors get the, the, uh, draft of the chapter we've been working on and they see exactly what they said, but they see it so well reflected and well organized and flowing on the paper. They say, how did you do that? I said, I didn't, you did. I just listened to what you said. And then I refracted it on paper. Right. And, uh, and that is, uh, it's, it's. It's an extremely valuable asset. I think people who talk all the time miss out on all sorts of valuable information or may, you know, they might not miss it, but they, they don't get nearly out of it what they could, uh, if they could stop for a minute and let other people talk. And I think, um, that, you know, I've, I could think of several relationships. I won't name any names, but I can think of several relationships. <laughs> Uh, where ex that are exactly what you described there, Rick, with, with your brothers and, and your, your parents, right? If they're, if they're constantly talking, then I'm content to let them talk, uh, because I know, right. That as soon as I start talking, um, I'm going to be interrupted and talked over. And I don't, I, that to me, that's not a, that's not a meaningful conversation. So I just, I'm content to let them talk and I'm not, a, I'm not angry because I don't get to talk. I'm not resentful. I'm just like, I'm not going to expend all that energy, uh, just to be interrupted and, and talked over. And, um, instead I'm going to absorb it and sort through what's meaningful and, you know, set the rest aside. Yeah. I, I, the same way, like, I don't, I don't feel bad for being in the corner of let's let people talk and something emerges great. It's not then. So that a great book in front of me, you know, that's right. So no, ghostwriting, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You had, uh, you had a follow up on that. But now what I want to know though, Rick, you like, so, okay, so you bring this skill set innately more than I did. I had to learn a great deal of it, but what I want to, what I want to delve into a little bit is, so you're, <clears throat> you've got this background in nursing, which is a wonderful skill set to have going into a, a writing project, but how did it start? What, what were some of the, you know, the lead off events or signals that you got that said, I should really try this. And then, you know, when you did it, what was, what was the response like for going into writing? Uh, um, good question. So, I mean, I, I don't want to be cliche, but I, I've always loved to read and write and as far as I can remember, I always had a book in my pocket and I always liked to write, um, essays and all that in school were, was fun for me. Um, I, I, I liked it. I think, and then nursing came along, of course, going through kind of a timeline, became, became a nurse. And, uh, I think I was, I knew from a young age, I wanted to go into healthcare. I wanted to be a caregiver. I didn't know exactly what, whether it was a physician or nursing or something ancillary. And it turned out my ex-wife became a physician and I became a nurse. And, um, there is an element of, of being near people at their best and worst and at the beginning and end. And there's, again, being the introvert and the empath, you feel things differently. And, um, so I, I thought I always felt the connection to humans in a unique way. Maybe other nurses do, maybe they don't, maybe other writers do, I don't know. And uh, along that journey, um, I, I kept on just writing for myself and nothing great, just my journals. And, you know, I, I used, I have tons of journals here and, and started a company back in 2001 and the company grew to a pretty large, substantial size. And so my journey as a writer, I always thought I might be a writer, uh, was kind of backburnered because I was a CEO of a fast growth company. And then about seven years ago, the company was acquired and I went from being a nurse to, um, a 
a CEO suddenly uh, wishless. I, I didn't have a title. Even though I still maintain my RN license, um, I wasn't actively a nurse. And so I suddenly found myself with um, the proverbial pinnacle of having exited a company and being in a place where a lot of entrepreneurs dream of being and uh, empty and lonely. And so I wrote about it. And that was actually my first book. And the ironic thing was, uh, I wasn't confident enough in my ability to write my own book, so I hired a ghostwriter. Oh. And I did. And uh, the ghostwriter helped me uh, do what I didn't feel confident enough in myself to do, and that's right what I was going through. The highs and lows. And so I wrote that story and published the book, and it's still out there on my Amazon page. And um, I looked back and I thought, what a mess. I can't believe I actually published that. It, uh, the story itself, uh, it's, it was, it's the truth, but the cover, the title, the stuff, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I would never have told a client to do what I did. <laughs> but, um, uh, so that kind of reinvigorated my, my desire to continue to write, to make it more of something, not just a side thing. And then COVID, uh, COVID, well, when I found myself isolated and with Vikings, isolation, um, was it was real where I was, where I was, was an extremely isolated place in the world. Um, it, I had to sign a lengthy NDA, so I couldn't even talk about where I was, mm -hmm. even though my family knew. And, um, even I was there in a capacity to, to be clear, I was there in the capacity of a registered, of an American registered nurse. Uh, so I wasn't there as a secret agent, but the, where I was, um, there was some very distinct work. There was classified work being done there. So. I had to, I had two choices and I, I was, I was alone. I couldn't take my family. So I couldn't yeah. take my wife and so, um, uh, enjoy the scenery, which I did and, you know, eat whale meat, which I did and write a lot, which I did. So I dove back into my writing. And of course, since the world shut down, here's kind of where the spark emerged that this could be something. I think Paul, at that time in my life, I was still trying to figure out, and this was my time in my life. This is just a few years ago. Sure. I was trying to yeah. figure out where, where I'm supposed to be. Um, I'm in my fifties and usually I have friends who are retiring, but I'm trying to figure out what's, what, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? I, I still look at my life as only, I'm only at the, um, second, second quarter. I still have quarter three and four. I'm halfway, halfway in my, my sprint. Yeah. And, um, like, what am I supposed to do? So I dove into the writing and I started taking writing courses and worked with coaches to fine tune my personal essays and fine tune my copywriting, I dove into email writing. And, and then because of my background as a CEO, a lot of my circle were all CEOs, all right. uh, founders and startup um, CEOs. And so suddenly they would reach out to me because one of where I was, what are you doing there? That, hey, Rick, I have a question. How do I maintain connection with my clients? Because I can't meet them anymore. There's no more martini lunches, no more coffee meets. And I'm like, send them an email. And they say, well, how do I do that? I'm like, your email list. I'm like, what's that? I'm like, okay, scratch that. Send them a newsletter. What's that? I'm like, okay, all the digital assets that you should have had in place um, to reach, to maintain connection with your clients, um, double down on those. They had nothing in place. And so, no. and so I said, let me help you write some emails. Let me help you write. And that, that was my foray into ghostwriting. I started ghostwriting emails and newsletters on behalf of company CEOs. And they hired me to do it from Norway. And they told two friends, like the, the old commercial, they told two friends and they told two friends. And suddenly I was writing newsletters and then white papers and then articles and publishing on their behalf. And I thought, huh, this is interesting. I'm writing for somebody else, but it was a world I, I already understood. I understood the, what it meant to lead a company with hundreds of employees or with millions of dollars in revenue or with payroll things. I understood that. So I, I already had a connection to what they were kind of going through, if you will, as, as founders and CEOs. And then one day somebody said, Hey, you know, you've been doing all this stuff. Can you write a book for me? And I'm like, like a book book. And they're like, yeah, a book book. What kind of book is there, Rick? And I said, <laughs> what kind of book? Like, uh, uh, how you did it or like how your process goes. And they said, no, I want to write it about, you know, how my journey as a CEO and entrepreneur. And I thought to myself, I guess that was kind of like the book I wrote, you know, seven years ago. Yep. And, and what they're asking me to do basically is be the ghostwriter that I had hired to help them. And it's funny how it all kind of connects. And, um, I said, yes, I said yes to a client and, um, that's kind of the journey. And I think, I, I think 
as I explored all different types of writing and genres from um, essays to all this personal writing to technical writing, um, because I did do technical writing. I actually wrote bids and proposals for federal contracting firms. Um, I fell in love with the ghostwriting piece. I think that's, that's where I really, I found a footing there. Yeah. I, I found that writing somebody else's story, I realized the way we kicked off the conversation, that's, that's how I could really tap into and harness, um, everything that people said was wrong with me. That's where I could tap into and harness the introversion, the yeah. lifting between the lines, the, the, the quiet, the quieting the spirit to hear somebody else's spirit. And I thought, this is what I felt. That I, this is how I felt that this is where I was supposed to be at this mm -hmm. point in my life, in my fifties. Um, all the things that people said I should, I should jettison that weren't going to serve me all of a sudden became my greatest asset. Yeah. And, uh, that person told another person and that person told another person, oh, Rick kind of really gets it. Rick understands. And not always that way, as you know, sure. you don't, you don't always have a good butt sniff with the client. Sometimes you sniff a butt and it's like a bad dog. <laughs> you just, it is, you aren't going to, you aren't going to have a good writing relationship, but that's, that's the nutshell of how it came to be. And, um, um, that's, I, that's what I find myself today. And I have the honor, it's a privilege to listen to somebody's heart, their soul, um, their story, and then put it into words for them and hoping and praying that they look at this and read it and say, oh, hell yeah. That's yeah. what I've been trying to say. Um, yeah. so that's, that's the, my journey so far as in today, dot, dot, dot. That's lovely. I was, uh, thinking of one of my favorite jokes I like to remind people, and that is that, uh, even God uses ghostwriters, right? All his, all his number one all-time bestseller is fully ghostwritten. Yeah. That's just, that's a good one. I like that. So, oh, no. if he uses them, there's pretty good, there's probably a pretty good reason for it because there's a guy who can write a perfect flawless book with no mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to use human ghostwriters, you know? Um, and God, oh, yeah, like you're, that. You, that one's free, by the way, you can use that one. <laughs> I like it. Even dying, he's just ghostwriters. That's a good one. The thing that stands out for me in, in, a, among the many things that we're talking about here, uh, is the settling process of all of these disparate components coming together. And like you talk about in your fifties going, you know, what am, what am I going to be when I grow up? And it's a it's really a combination of all of those things that come together, but you can't force them. They have to just sort of evolve organically. Uh, and, and kind of like a concrete, if, if you cure it too fast, it's going to be brittle. You have to give it time and then it's going to be strong. And I feel like that's the same, that's the same process that is somehow mysteriously at work in your journey. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's, um, you know, there's no such thing as coincidence. I don't believe that. I think everything is preordained and, um, I believe in God and what, whatever one's belief is, it's to, that's to them. But I believe that I step into the day, um, that's already been set before me and it's, it's my job to do my best into it. And it's funny you say all that, Jason, because I used to, I, what emerged for me as you're saying that is force versus flow is at a younger age, when I was building the company, it was grind, it was hustle, it was drive, it was this, it was win, win, you know, like they do in, and, uh, like, uh, uh, you did in a breakfast club, you got to win, Angie, you got to win. And that, that was the mantra. My, my father was a Marine in Vietnam and, um, I love my dad and he always, he was a hard driver, successful in his own right. And, um, right now he's in Vegas about, I think he's going to see the Super Bowl, but, um, it was instilled in me and I thought that's how it's gotta be. You've got to force, you know, if there's no path and you try, you make the path yeah. and it worked for a long time. And, um, there were casualties of that, you know, divorce and missed things and the things that entrepreneurs say, we don't have to, uh, the flip side is being a stay at home dad. I, I could not do that. No offense to stay at home dads. I, I need to be producing, mm -hmm. but, um, what emerged for me is it's so funny you say that because I was on a call with a client yesterday and it was a check-in call and, um, I'm coaching her through a book. So it's not a ghost client. 
And she said, Rick, something, something, a light just went off in my head when I listened to a recording you sent to me because I've been trying to force this to come out. I've been trying to force. And she said, then I went to my jujitsu. She's, she practices jujitsu and she goes in jujitsu. We never force, we move with the flow. And she goes, I realized that I could just apply that flow to my life and to the book I'm trying to get out. Um, it would be easier. She goes, and I did, and it was. And so you're right. When you say force, you're saying that whole force thing. I'm like, oh my God, not only was it brought to my consciousness just 24 hours ago right now, um, but I realized that I was also a victim of that. I was trying to force things when, can't look back, right? But I always wondered, what if I had just gone with the flow, stepped into yeah. what was supposed to have been? Um, I don't know. Yeah, those are great, great observations. And I love this. I love where this conversation is, is going so far. <laughs> so as you ghostwrite other people's stories, how do you manage that force versus flow spectrum for yourself? That's, um, so two ways I look at that. One is, uh, a lot of folks, you know, there's a lot of folks out there talk about writer's block and, um, and you have to be in a mood or you have to be in the spirit, you have to be in the flow to, to you know, you have, it's creative. And while that's all true, uh, uh, there's a point though, where let me give you an example. If a pipe in my house breaks and, um, I need it fixed and I call a plumber and he shows up, um, if he ever said, or she Rick, I can't do it today. I have plumber's block. I would say, eh. My point is that my point is that as a ghostwriter, I'm hired to do a job. Yeah. Um, whether, whether I'm in flow or not, um, that's not the problem of the person stroking the check to me. It's my problem. So sometimes I do have to force it. And that might mean, uh, setting my alarm earlier, which I don't like to do. It might mean canceling something. It might mean that this isn't my normal writing time. But son of a bitch, this guy, this girl wrote me a check. I, I've got to fix the plumbing. I yeah. cannot say I've got writer's block. I cannot say. So that's one way I look at force versus flow. Um, but at the point where, where me personally, well, speaking for myself, when I sit down to write, um, I have to find the flow. I have to. And there are things that I'll do. Um, I listen to white noise. I don't have a, a playlist. I don't have a rock. I don't have, I, I literally put, um, this headset much like yours, Jason, it's noise canceling and it's white noise and whatever reason, just that white nothingness, um, it's like everybody has their thing, but that just clears everything. It's almost like a, a rushing water stream that clears all the junk out of my head. So when I look up at my other screen and see the story I'm writing, I'm like, now that fills the space. No. Um, force versus flow. It's, uh, it can, it's so many applications, I think, for, uh, writers and ghost writers. And, um, I, we all deal with their face differently. Shameless plug for noise canceling headphones. Noise canceling headphones, uh, re revolutionized my life because I would find myself at a coffee shop with my noise canceling headphones on, sometimes not listening to anything or, uh, just, I think a year, a year ago, I was traveling off into New Jersey area and ended up back at home. I had traveled, I think 20 hours or something like that, slept overnight at the, the airport and all this other nonsense. And on the bus ride back to my house, my headphones shut off. And I was like, oh, I still have headphones on. I had <laughs> forgotten that my headphones went on like 15 hours earlier. <laughs> And it Crazy. was the most blissful experience, uh, you know, before the broadcast, we were talking about being, a being in a, you know, de deserted airport, that airport might as well have been deserted for me. The train ride might as well have been deserted because oh, I yeah. couldn't, I didn't hear any of those inputs that I didn't agree to, you know, and that's, that's all that cacophony of sound for me. So yes, uh, shameless plug for noise canceling headphones. If you're ever in the, you ever need to focus. Yep. Yeah, we have an affiliate link, by the way, to a certain, to Jason's, uh, right. The next. Yeah. My Bose QC 35s. Yeah. But you know, that that's true. I like the same thing happened for me, probably around age 36, which is getting on about seven or eight years ago. 
Uh, I remember being at SeaTac Airport and SeaTac Airport already drives me nuts. I just don't like, I don't like large hub airports anymore. And I don't even have the noise canceling ones, but just putting in my AirPods and playing music, instrumental music that, you know, gives me a sense of like things are moving, even when I'm standing there in a line that doesn't move, I feel better. It's something about the auditory processing. Uh, but Rick, the, the one, one more thing I really wanted to touch on, so just because this is kind of fresh for Jason and I right now, is, um, <clears throat> you know, I think, I think what, a, what an author considering working with a ghostwriter, editor, publisher, et cetera, should plan for is a, a an initial stage of, uh, that, that sometimes means peeling back layers uh, because you can come into it a little bit guarded, a little bit apprehensive, or maybe you just have a naturally guarded personality, but you know, you want to get this message out there. You know, you got, you know, you got something to offer. And, uh, I, you know, I'm curious to talk through that a little bit with you to, you know, to, because there's, there's things that we do and in my experience, even perhaps things that we should, you know, set as institutional guideposts in what we do to avoid uh, making up what people are saying versus what they actually really want to say. Cause that's a huge part of it, right? You want to get that point. Like you said, where the client says, oh my gosh, you, this is me. How did you know this? Right. And yet you can run into, uh, clients who, uh, you know, just spew a lot of what's on their mind and heart, but don't really quite capture what kind of tone they want to set. So you're left to fill it in, you know, in our case, cause we're such quiet, strong listeners. Um, so talk a little bit about that. I mean, what do you, when you're working with a client, how do you, how do you get them to, you know, you, you can't, it's something it's, it, which was just as easy as saying, just tell me what's really deepest, darkest on your, on your heart. But it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. So I'd like to hear it from you if, if you know what I'm talking about. I do. And that's, um, I think it starts from the very, very beginning. It starts, uh, I mentioned butt sniff earlier and, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't want people to get offended by that because if, if, if you have a dog or even if you don't, if you've seen dogs in the dog park and you let your dog out, first thing they do is they run up to their dog and they sniff each other's butt. And it's just an indica it's this primal indicator of, um, a good or evil of uh, fight or flight. And I think humans, we also have that. And, um, it starts for me, it starts in the beginning because I have to get on a zoom call with people. I want to see, um, I want to see them. I want them to see me, even though it's maybe a warm introduction and I'm not going to, I would, because so far my, my clients have been uh, warmly introduced to me. So there's already, uh, at least the first degree connection. But there's got to be that initial sniff. And I think we intuitively sense it that we can, we can tell like this, this is a, this is as a writer, this is something I think, okay, I, I feel the shell. Um, my, the question I ask myself as the conversation unfolds is, uh, will I be able to crack it? But more than that is, am I going to have to crack it or mm. will it just organically open up? You know, will this be a relationship where they will come out of the shell? Or is this, or is this a relationship where I'm going to have to slightly just start to peck away at it? And, um, I, I also think that the other person feels it because as I hate to use this word, but as soft as I think people like us are, cause we're, we're introverted, we're empaths. We don't want to create chaos because yeah. I have to ask myself, am I going to be okay? And is this person going to be okay if I need to take the hammer and yeah. um, um, start to hammer away? Um, what's that going to do to them, um, to the relationship and, um, how much hammering am I going to have to do? And I, I know I'm speaking to a lot of kind of, um, fluffy wordish type of things, but that's how I, I think about it. The very first conversation, mm -hmm. um, this may seem also cliche, but there's the whole five why thing, you know, you ask why five times and, um, real story. I talked to somebody and, and we got to the point and they were telling me a story about something that was very personal to them. And I asked them why it's so personal. They said, oh, because it reminds me of yada, yada, yada. Very shift here. Very like, this is what surface I tell. Level. Yeah. yeah surfacey. And I said, well, why is that important to you? And, um, 
She said, I just told you it's because I did. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, all right, I don't want to have this. That's when I started to think, do I need to bring the hammer out or mm -hmm. do I just let it go? Because this is a negative butt sniff test. And I'm um, good person, a person I could be friends with, you know, grab sure. a drink with or whatever. She was super nice and very warm introduction. And it's like, well, why is that important to you? And then it stayed too surfacey. And I said, can I tell you why I'm asking you why? And she said, yeah, sure. And to what Jason said earlier is, is as I was telling her why I was asking, she was talking objecting. And I'm like, you want to hear? And that's when I think a little bit of flippancy came out of me. Cause I'm like, yeah, I'm bringing the sledgehammer out now, period. It's sledgehammer time and we're going to be friends or it's sledgehammer time. And she's going to, she is going to see this is where he's trying to take me. This is where I need to go. Or she's going to say, I just exposed something about me that I don't want to expose and we're not going to go there. So, um, I, I don't know how to tactically write that out for somebody who no, says it's not a procedure. No. Yeah, it's exactly. It's not a procedure. It's not a, it's not a, if you want to really connect as a client, here's four things you got to do. It's not, it's, I think it's something innate and intuitive. And, um, on the flip side is the whole five why things. And it, it works for me because when you just ask and step away, um, some, a lot of time, often magic happens, a real conversation. Uh, I met with two young men and this was not about a book. This was about their story. And they were, they had formed a company. Uh, they were not young men, they were in the thirties. And, uh, we met down, I'm, I'm pointing like you're here downstairs in the coffee shop. But, and, um, they wanted to, I, I would mentor companies and, uh, this was before I was ghostwriting and, and they wanted to show their idea and the efficacy could it be, could, could they make something of it? And, and so one of them was talkative. He was the one, he was the, the voice. The other one kind of sat there was a listener and the, the talker was like, now we're going to conquer the world. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. I'm like, okay, cool. I said, why does it matter so much to you though? And, um, he went on, I said, I want to hear from you. Tell him, I want, I want him to want tell him me. to talk. Yeah. And, um, he said something, he goes, yeah, what he said, you know, we want to be number one. We want to be this. I'm like, I got it. And I said, well, why is that so important? And talking, talking goes, and I'm like, I time out. I said, I got it. I said, tell me. And he said, you know, because, um, I've been working at this job. Um, he was a salesman for a local sports team. And, um, you know, I've been working at it for a while and I just, I can't seem to make the advancements. I, I know I deserve I'm like, quite oh, cool. I said, well, why is that so important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. I said, the rule of the game, he's going to answer you. Yeah. Literally. And I said, I said, first of all, before he answered it, do you know that about him? He goes, no. I was like, all right, he's an answer. So ask him again. He said, I got, I got a family. You know, I, my wife, uh, we want to have another kid and, and my wife, uh, she's ready to kind of, you know, be the sit on mom. And, and I said, okay, so why is that important to you? And, uh, he, it got deeper. But then you could, you could just feel it to get deep. And the final time, when he talked about his family and his kids and, um, and the whole, there was just a shift, even walkie talkie felt the shift and even walkie talkie just sat there and was looking at his partner, like, holy shit. Man, and, man. um, I thought, why is that so important to you? And, uh, we started crying and we're in a coffee shop downstairs and I didn't, it wasn't the intention. It was, but it wasn't. Um, he started crying and not bawling, but you could see the tears coming out and just a grown man with children, um, as a career. And he said, because when I was a kid, he goes, I'll never forget. Um, my mom worked so hard for us, me and my little brother. And we used to think it was fun sleeping in the car until the day I realized that we didn't have a home and my mm -hmm. mom would, my mom would take us to school. She'd open the back door and then she'd go to work. And then we'd have to meet that guy at the car. And we lived that way for whatever point is, that was his story. He goes, I don't ever want my family to have to live in a car. And I yeah. said, that's your why that is your anchor. That is a thing you need to hammer into the wall and don't ever forget that. Yeah. If you, if you let that be the railroad spike that you hang the rest of your life off of, you will never fail. Yeah. And he looked at me and he goes, nobody's ever said that. I said, you just did. I yeah. said, that is the thing that is going to drive you. Not mm -hmm. I want to be number one, not I want to make money, not I want to have a new Ferrari, not any of that. You do not ever want your kids to sleep in the backseat of a car. And I yeah. said, walkie talkie, you take that lesson and you guys go build something and you, you don't need a mentor. 
you need that. Yeah. If I can't get to that place in a conversation with somebody, I, I can't, I, me, it's not worth the check they're going to write to me. It's just, it's not, I, I need them to spill their guts, their heart, mm -hmm. their soul. Um, I need them to be able to feel comfortable enough at a coffee shop around people and shed a tear in front of me. Mm. Because if they asked me, I would do the same. Yeah. So I don't know how to process, process size that. It's just something that just, it happens or it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, and I can feed Jason's getting really excited by this, but it's, this is, this is one of the reasons I wanted, uh, I wanted to hear this from Rick, uh, Jason is just, you know, I remember you telling me that story one time, or maybe it was in, uh, some, some projects we've worked on together in the past and I, and you were asking it and, um, yeah. it's, you know, this is, this is one reason Rick that, um, uh, that I, uh, admire and look up to you as somebody who, um, does what I do better than I do it because that doesn't occur to me. Right. That's one of the reasons I work with Jason. Jason understands that. And I understand it when I hear it, but doing it is, is a very difficult thing for me. But I, I, I wanted you to, I wanted the audience to hear that because you're right. right. What you, what you reached there with him was something that was where there was no compromise for, for that young man. It was, it was do or die. Right. And it was, and it was so focused on the, the things that are truly important that it takes on the, the life of the eternal, right? It takes on these deep desires that, you know, any good parent has, but then it's, and when it's driving, the, when it's the driving force behind what they're doing, you're right. It's going to carry them way further out than any uh, carrot that they could get, that they could grasp as a reward. So. Really good. Really, thanks so much for for sharing that with us, so Jason. You've you've been sitting there itching to talk, so I'm going to yield the floor. Um, well, I, I feel like Rick and I are cut from the same block because uh, I don't know how it happens, but when I discovered that that my superpower is probably I was probably mid thirties, something like that, and I had sold a successful company and had retired, and then started thought, well, maybe I'll just advise other people, and uh, very similar, similarly. A guy came in and talked to, about me helping grow his business. And I thought, well, that might be true, but he was there with his wife and I could sense there was something off between the two of them. And I thought, well, any old dummy can help you grow your business. Uh, but there's something here that needs to be spoken and I don't know what it is, but I know it's there. And until we get to the bottom of that, we're not going any further. So long story short, he credits me with his first child, uh, which I had nothing to you know, I was just a facilitator of the conversations, but that first year of working with me, his business was up 40%. And he, one day he came into me and said, Hey, uh, you saved me 50 grand today. And I was like, I did not talk to you today. How did I do this? He said, well, you know, I heard your voice over my, over my shoulder as I was going to make this rash decision. He's a, and he, and he, and I heard it like, it's not going to help me build my family. So I, I left that dealership and did not buy that $50,000 car that I wanted. Uh, and he, within that same year, not only was he does up 40%, but he had his first kid. So I think the very similarly to, to you, uh, my, my goal is to always figure out what the, what's the thread that holds your sweater together because that thread is consistent throughout your life. It is consistent in all of your experiences in some way. Anything great that you've done, any big failure you have, that thread is there. When you find it, you will change your perspective and you might be able to, uh, you might be able to connect with somebody else as well, but all that surface stuff, it's meaningless. And, uh, from a business consulting standpoint, you know, there's it, lots of people can help you build more widgets faster, better, cheaper. Uh, but yeah, changing your life, that's, that's altogether something different. So, uh, I'm, I'm appreciative of that, that story. And also, uh, your story about living with Vikings. I'm, <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> so we, we're at the, we're at the end of our time for this episode. 
I feel like we could go on for a long time digging into human nature and how we connect in a meaningful way. And I use that word meaningful, uh, not as some, you know, throwaway term. I think that there is meaning that we can discover within ourselves and meaning, meaning that we can connect uh, to and with other people. And until we find that, we've just not gone far enough. And um, certainly back to introverts, I think introverts actually play a special role in the world in helping people find that meaning. So, Paul? For sure. Rick, it's been so good to have you uh, joining us on the podcast today. If uh, people want to learn more about you and the services that you offer and uh, read about the Viking story, where should we send them? <laughs> The easiest place is just to, um, to go to, uh, it's the rudimentary website, therickmartinez.com. It's just V with my name, therickmartinez.com. All right. Well, we've been blessed by your presence, my friend, and, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, seeing you again sometime soon. But in the meantime, uh, this has been the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. My name's Paul Edwards. Our guest is Rick Martinez. And my co-host, Jason Todd, we will see you next time. Thanks, y'all.